Right now in Vancouver's East End, they're taking their fixes. For a few drugged hours, they'll feel okay. They'll sleep away a few more hours, then they'll come too. And in a hundred shabby dens and dingy hotels and cheap housekeeping rooms, Vancouver's drug addict population will ask the same old question. What can I steal today? Where can I steal it? Will I be able to sell it? Who can I rob? How much is left from what the girlfriend made last night? The girlfriend is a prostitute. Beautiful Vancouver, the blackest black in the evil limbo of Canada's illicit narcotics trade. Vancouver, where recently three addicts committed involuntary suicide by accidentally taking overdoses of heroin. A city where in certain drug stores you can buy a pre-packaged injection kit to give yourself a fix. Close-ups Jack Webster talks with one of Vancouver's 2,000 addicts, an ex-con who lives his sorry sickness to its full. His chances of kicking the habit, all but nil. His habit will get worse. His frantic fixes more frequent. His pathetic existence more and more degraded. And one day he'll die as he lives. Hooked. Tell me, have you ever seen a kit like this? Yes, it's uh, an outfit for taking a fix. It's a do-it-yourself kit for drug addicts, isn't it? Yeah, it's a... Uh, it's a... Uh, a uh, hypodermic syringe that, you, that we use uh, for taking effect. How much do they cost? Uh, 53 cents. And where do you buy them? Well, in the drug source. Oh, uh, what do you ask for when you want one of these? Uh, insulin needle and a dropper. Do you call it that, or do you ask for an outfit? No, insulin needle and a dropper. And it's quite legal for you to buy this, is it? Oh, yes. Yeah. Although I should imagine the guy knows what you want it for. Yeah, well, I guess they, they give you a funny look on them. Well, they sell yeah, it yeah. to you. Yeah, they give it to you. Now, supposing just for a moment that the sale of all these needles and eyedroppers was back with all the hundreds of addicts we have, would it make it difficult for people like you to take fixies for themselves? No, oh, no, they would just start black marketing them. Black market? Somebody would come up with them, and instead of paying 53 cents, you might pay 2 or $3. Well, if you must be an addict, though, why don't you go and buy a proper hypodermic syringe that could measure the doors? Well, uh, these are cheaper and uh, they're handier. They're uh, speedier. So what do you mean, handier and speedier? Well, you can uh, use these with the one hand, and uh, when you go uh, wherever you go to take your fix, you uh, you want to get it done as quick as possible, so as, there's less chance of getting arrested. Yeah, has an occasion ever arisen though where you had to do without a needle? What do you do then? Well. It, Twice I've, uh, I've had to use just a dropper without the needle. How do you do that? Oh, once was in prison. In a prison? Yeah. Well, what do you mean? You were going to have a fix in jail? Yeah. Well, you better just explain that a wee bit to me. Had you been arrested and managed to hold on to a capsule of Yeah, well, I was arrested and had some uh, drugs in me. And uh, when I was in the jail, there was no needle. It was just a dropper. So what did you do? So I uh, had a safety pin and made the hole with the safety pin. Where was that? See on your... No, just below the knee. Uh-huh. More or less like in the calf. Uh-huh. Somewhere where it's, uh, you get a steady, uh, you know, uh, like in your arm, you couldn't very well do it because you couldn't keep it steady enough. Couldn't you know? hold your arm yeah. steady. So, so you would your... come to your skin with a safety pin and look it into a hole. That's right. And then what? Then you'd have everything already in the dropper, and as you pull the needle out, the safety pin out, you put the mouth of the dropper over the hole at the same time, and then uh, squeeze it in. Just and plunge it, it right into your blood Yeah, you have to put a lot of pressure so it don't run out. But uh, when you hit it right away, the hole stays open, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it's like a skin shot. That's a grim business for taking a fix, isn't it? Well, when you're sick, you don't notice those things. How long have you been an addict? Oh, about seven, eight years. How many caps of heroin a day do you need to keep going in your curious way? Well, uh, at the present, uh, two or three. But uh, whatever, if I could get more, I would use more. You would use more. So that for $5 a cap, you're going to have to raise at least $15 a day at the moment for your habit alone. Yeah, that's on the average of a day. How do you raise that $15? Because I know you're not working. 
Well, as a rule, uh, I'm the boost. Explain that for me. Well, uh, shoplifting. Your immediate target is just another $5, isn't That's it? That's right. Where do you live? Do you live in the same place every night? I don't know. Move around. Because, uh, you bothered too much of you. And uh, once they know where you live... So last uh, night you would stay, what, in a hotel room? Stay in a hotel and... Tonight? Another one and move on like that. What odds would you give me on your being arrested within the next 24 hours? Oh, as far as I'm concerned, I'd give you a good odds that I wouldn't be arrested. Yeah. Because you always figure you're as smart as they are. How <laughs> many times have you tried, if ever, to break this uh, habit? Well, every time you get arrested, you, you tell yourself you're going to break it, but... Uh, you come back, you come out, you go right back on it. When you go into the... But, uh, I've tried a couple of times outside. Mm -hmm. I've lasted a few months, and then something just makes you drift back. You know as well as I do that three young men have died in Vancouver recently from an accidental overdose of heroin. Don't you think there's a chance that this very afternoon, if the police don't catch you first, that you might, well, kill yourself with, say, uh, a cap of heroin, which is pure heroin, instead of being diluted? Well, no, there's no chance they were catching pure heroin. What do you think killed these chaps, then? They were all healthy, otherwise healthy people. Well, I... It must have been, uh, They were, uh, drinking liquor and taking those, uh... Invitals and goofballs and... That Borden and then taking effect. Mixing it up, in other words. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? What lies ahead for you, though? You're an um, admitted user. There is no future. <laughs> what do the druggists say? Webster interviews Douglas Denham, registrar of the Pharmaceutical Association of British Columbia. Uh, we're taking action under the provisions of the Pharmacy Act. Are you going to stop the sale of these kits by members of your association, by every druggist in the province? <laughs> the number of drugstores in which such a kit could be bought is very limited. But even if only one or two is selling them, isn't it a terrible thing that uh, somebody packages do-it-yourself kits for addicts? It certainly is. Coroner Glenn MacDonald conducted the inquests into the heroin deaths. Three within three weeks, compared with only four or five in the whole of 1958. MacDonald's warning to the addict population, every time you take a fix, you could be committing suicide. This would just be a case of these addicts wanting to get a bigger kick out of a bigger fix, would it? They may have been wanting to do that, Jack. On the other hand, they may have received an overdose. Why would a man want to try and commit suicide all of a sudden? He wasn't necessarily trying to commit suicide, Jack. It may have been that in the capping, and if you understand how the capping is done, we have a back-end man or a capper who normally will have a pile of heroin on one side and some milk sugar or lactose on the other. And We're talking about the agent in the underworld who's preparing it for sale. Who is preparing it for sale. Mm -hmm. The um, old-timer was very proud of the type of work he put out. He would mix them carefully, mm -hmm. and by using a rolling pin would make sure that the heroin and the milk sugar melted together before it was put into a cap. Mm -hmm. However, it may be that the present-day cappers are getting careless. They've got amateurs in the city. But the amateurs are taking over, and they're mixing them up. And it is possible that someone will get a loaded cap or a heavy cap. In other words, this cap, by a loaded cap, you mean instead of being a minute proportion of heroin and a large proportion of milk sugar, it might be pure heroin. It might be pure heroin. In a way, it's a form of Russian roulette. Just as you have the empty chamber following the loaded chamber, so the addict may get a cap which is overloaded and lethal dosage. Is the public in this city aware of this grim uh, story of people playing Russian roulette with the drug addict capsules in shoddy back rooms? Of course, Jack, until the, the three sudden deaths which we had in this connection, I think we've always been aware of it. It's something we like to think of happening over on the other street, behind the tapestry. Mm -hmm. But as a result of these three deaths and as a result of the publicity which has come to it, I think they are now aware that this is a problem. What about the attitude of the young addicts you have in your court, or should I say, the young people in the circle of addicts who come in here to give testimony from time to time? In connection with one of the 23-year-old lads that uh, died from an overdose, his girlfriend, 15 years old. How old? 15. Rather cynically and with all the sophistication in the world, suggested the only cure for her boyfriend of 23 was death. Mm -hmm. Although she did agree that she talked with him, tried to get him to kick his habit, and his only comment was, I wish, but I can't get any help. Dr. Robert Halliday would like to help. 
He's director of the Narcotic Addiction Foundation, a pilot project sponsored by the B.C. government. But his addicts are mostly outpatients. The foundation can take only four persons in residence. The foundation's grant, $75,000. A 75,000 budget for you, and yet shoplifters will take at least two million a year to keep that habit going. Yeah, that is very true. Does that include mm -hmm. the estimate of money, say, on prostitution or other criminal acts? Um, no. No, we don't really know what the figures in that might be. There have been uh, statements that it might cost the community anywhere from uh, five to ten million a year. Well, uh, why is it so black here, Doctor? Why have we got the biggest center of addiction in all of Canada? Well, if we knew why we have got the highest divorce rates, alcohol rates, and so on, we'd know the answer to that. It's a very complex social and economic problem that we can't uh, pin down to any one thing. So you would tie them together, the alcoholism, divorce, and drug addiction on the West Coast here? Yes, I think that they're all separate aspects of delinquency or social disorder. But can't we say to ourselves cynically that uh, we're bound to have this uh, kind of addiction, in large numbers even? No, I don't think so. Other large cities don't have it. I don't see why we should have it here. Does the community realize the problem, or do they push it under the carpet? I think they do tend to sweep it under the carpet. Um, they are aware of the figures, of course, but uh, uh, it's much nicer to think about the mountains of the North Shore than to think about the uh, addicts in the East End. We find this attitude, I think, that many addicts say, uh, if only we could get free legal drugs, we could still be useful members of society. Is this just can't, do you think? I think that it is a, uh, it's a kind of fantasy that the addict has and that many other people share with the addict. Um, if one understands the nature of chemical addiction and that uh, because of the tolerance factors of the drugs, that is the need for more and more drugs to produce the same effect, uh, then I think one begins to understand that it isn't really possible to give our drugs through free clinics on a regularly prescribed dosage every day. This is all that's going to keep increasing. Mm -hmm. And if the addict can't get it in the clinic, he's going to get it elsewhere. Well, that we're giving three legal drugs to these people might be like giving three uh, liquor to alcoholics. I would think so, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It'll be a very, very dangerous uh, experiment. But you'd be the first to admit, Doctor, that you're only scraping the very surface of this problem. Well, that's very true. This is only a pilot project, and uh, we have uh, a couple of years ahead of us to find out something about this problem. Um, we're going to um, need all the help and support that we can get from the community. Do you think the community is going to awaken to this ghastly problem? Um, they haven't awakened so far, and I think it's certainly time that they did, uh, considering the size of the problem not only here but all over Canada. This is Detective Al Shepard's beat. He's been a Vancouver drug squad man for eight years. His testimony drew attention to the do-it-yourself kits. Drug squad life is tough, nasty, monotonous. But every once in a while, there's a big break. You recently cracked the case in which four men were sent to jail for, I think, a total of 31 years for conspiracy to traffic in narcotics. Tell me how you got into that one. How did you start that case? Well, Jack, that started by a, a BC telephone lineman uh, going out and he was checking the bases of poles for dry rot. And he came across this cache of narcotics. And uh, we were notified and uh, went out and put a 24-hour watch on that cache of narcotics. And, How did it develop from there, then? What had been happening there? Well, uh, a car came along one night. Uh, the driver whom we recognized, the passenger we recognized. The passenger got out and uh, was shown the cache by the driver, who then drove off in his car and left the... the uh, passenger to pick it up, which he did, and uh, he was arrested. They were, both picked, up they were both picked up after. Would that be one of a number of plants by this plant man around the city? Yes, it was. Yes, we had uh, observations kept on other caches at that same time, and the same car and same driver appeared, and uh, uh, other pushers. Mm -hmm. And they were all eventually arrested, and that accounted for the, the driver of the car. He received 10 years, and the uh, the three other pushers received seven years of peace. There's uh, a common conception that the drug addict never commits any of the major crimes of violence. How does that stack up with your experience? Well, they do. They commit major crimes of violence. I, I know uh, quite a number of addicts who have committed crimes of violence and have been convicted. You mean of, things like bank robbery, bank yes, hold up? Yes. Of course, there's a popular conception that uh, the addict doesn't go in for violence, but when he's desperate, he'll do anything. He'll do anything, but... Uh, 
taking it all around, the, the majority of addicts do go in for the smaller crimes. Uh, where does prostitution come in? Well, I would say in all the female addicts, I know that they are all active prostitutes. This is how they support their habit. They have to be prostitutes for, to support their... Are product. many of them working for other addicts? So, I mean, supplying money to the addicts for their the oh, male yes. habit. Yes, uh, most female addicts have a male addict who tags along with them at all times, and uh, that girl will try and support both their habits. Well, don't give me any trade secrets, but most of the addicts must know your methods. Oh, yes, they, they pretty well know. Uh, they're always watching for police, as I say, and once they, if it's a hotel room, they're in. Uh, practically in all cases, the attic will leave a window open, and in the event of police uh, coming to the door, uh, he'll throw every, all the evidence out the window. Now, why, why is this? Have you not got sufficient evidence when you've seen him take the drugs into his hotel room? No, we have not. We have to, there is no crime to be an addict. The uh -huh. crime is in possessing the drugs. Tell me we, about this technique you use in the washroom, when there may be two of you go in uh, to, towards the washroom. What's the technique? Well, we sometimes use a lockstep method. We'll walk up the hallway uh, as one detective, and uh, the last one or the first one would stop at the door the addict is in, and the other one will carry right on down the hall. Oh, I see. The addict thinks there's only one footstep, one set of footsteps coming. That's right. And the first detective walks past. That's right. And the other detective stops at the door. Yes. And when he thinks the time is right, uh, we usually give them about five minutes from uh, the time we last see them leave the street. And uh, then we'll have to uh, crash the door down and get in the best way we can. Now, uh, that five minutes, why do you allow five minutes? Is this the time it takes for the addict to prepare? Is it? That's right. We, we think uh, after five minutes that... Uh, the addict has the capsule in solution and uh, drawn up into the eyedropper, and he is ready to take his fix. And that is the time that we like to hit the door. Well, have you had any cases where you've gone in too soon, perhaps? Does that make it difficult for you? Yes, we've had a lot of cases where we've gone in too soon. A lot of these addicts today are will go to their room, and they'll, uh, you might say, wait, wait out the policeman. Yeah. And uh, oh, we give them their, our a lot of time and we'll hit the door and uh, we may get into the room and they're laying on the bed reading the magazine. With the no evidence of nothing. No evidence at room. all, but if they have the drugs which is they'll carry in their mouth, all they have to do is swallow it and it's gone. If he swallows the drugs, the capsules in his mouth, and you know that the capsules are in his stomach, this doesn't constitute possession for you. No, it does not. You can't pump out your stomach for instance. No, no, we can't do that. That just isn't allowed. Not allowed. Do you see any end to it as the legislation is now where there's difficult of prove, difficulty of proving possession of uh, narcotics? And not, not an offense in itself in being an addict? Well, if, uh, if the law state had been an addict as a crime, mm -hmm. it would be a simple matter to uh, remedy the situation in Vancouver. What are your own ideas on that, then? Well, I never gave an opinion on this before, but... Uh, uh, I do think that uh, in the experience I've had and conversations I've had with addicts, that uh, about the only way is for the courts, for the police to obtain their evidence the same way as we do today. Mm -hmm. But instead of the courts sentence them to a term in jail, uh, give them an indefinite sentence on maybe some island or uh, some place where these addicts are away from society. I mean, even when you send them into the local jail or the penitentiary, it's not doing any good, is it? It's not doing any good, no. Do you but think that the heavy prison sentences which have been given recently to, well, I mean, not mean recently, in the last few years, 10, 20 year sentences, 14 year sentences, have done anything to discourage the pushing or the distribution of drugs in Vancouver? Definitely not. Quite definitely. We have just as many pushers today and as we ever did. And more addicts uh, apparently. We have uh, a lot of sentences have been meted out, 10 years, 12 years, 14 years, and it doesn't seem to scare them at all. Mm. Can you tell me or uh, uh, prove to me or uh, show me that addicts can be cured? I think addicts can be cured, but it's, uh, it's got to be up to the addict. Mm -hmm. Of the thousands you know, how many have been cured? 
Well, uh, I, I can count them on my one hand, I think, the ones that I know that uh, have gone off drugs and left drugs alone. Yeah. Um, all the rest, have, uh, they may go off drugs, they may stay off drugs for a year, but uh, eventually they'll come back to it. At the moment, you're going to go back out again tonight and tomorrow looking for the same old faces to put them back in jail. Just the same thing, day in and day out.